welcome everyone to this third panel in the series Election Matters 2022. My name is Barry Burden. I'm a professor of political science, director of the Elections Research Center here at the university. This panel is on the intersection of campaign finance rules and election misinformation and disinformation, particularly on social media platforms. So we have a lot to cover in one hour. Uh, this event is co-hosted by the Elections Research Center, which I direct, and the State Democracy Research Initiative, which is based here at UW Law School. I want to thank immediately Ali Bolt, Bree Grossy Wild, Levi Bankston, and all the others who have made this happen. It's complicated with a hybrid format that continues to change by the minute over the last 24 hours or so. So we're glad to see you all here. Uh, the event is sponsored by Stafford Rosenbaum, LLP, a firm, a law firm based here in Madison with very deep roots in Madison and has been a sponsor of the entire series, so we're delighted to have them. I also want to welcome Stafford attorney Jeffrey Mandel. Jeff is a partner at Stafford. He leads the practice team on election and political law. He has litigated election law issues in multiple state and federal courts, particularly the Wisconsin Supreme Court, where he may hold the record for the most minutes of arguing on the floor of that body on issues ranging from candidate ballot access to maintenance of voter registration rolls to rules governing absentee voting. Uh, Jeff is also the founder, president, and lead counsel of Law Forward, a nonprofit legal organization aimed at defending democracy, also based here in Madison. Uh, so let me turn it over to Jeff to introduce the speakers. Thanks so much, Barry. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to the Elections Research Center. Thank you to the State Democracy Research Initiative for helping to co-sponsor this event, to Rob, Miriam, Bree, Ali, and the whole increasingly large team that they have built. Um, thank you to Dean Takaji and the Law School for hosting today's event. And thank you to everyone who's attending both here and in cyberspace. Uh, Stafford Rosenbaum's election and political law group is thrilled to sponsor this series of lectures each of which has been on timely, important topics, and all featuring experts uh, brought in by the Elections Research Center and the State Democracy Research Initiative, whose ideas we are lucky enough to draw upon in our own litigation work and our discussions and considerations of, of these issues. Today's panel is particularly timely. We're heading into the home stretch of the election campaign. We're eight weeks out from election day today, with both campaign finance and election misinformation as essential issues. Usually I spend most of my day at my desk, um, but today this is my third event of the day. <laughs> the first was a court hearing and election misinformation was discussed. The second was a panel discussion downtown on current topics in Wisconsin election administration and both election finance and election misinformation were major topics. Uh, we have the privilege today of hearing from well-known experts who we hope are going to illuminate, if not solve, these thorny issues in the next hour. <laughs> um, and I'm going to uh, introduce them in the order that I believe they're speaking. So Katie Harboth on the, on the uh, screen here is the CEO of Anchor Change, which helps clients navigate the intersection of technology and policy around campaigns and elections. Katie serves as the Director of Technology and Democracy for the International Republican Institute. She's a fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center also at the Integrity Institute, and also at the Atlantic Council. She's previously worked at Facebook, the Republican National Committee, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and on numerous campaigns. She serves on a number of boards, including that of the Center for Journalism Ethics here at UW-Madison, and she's an alum of the university with a degree in journalism and political science. Daniel Kreis is a professor of political communication at UNC's Hussman School of Journalism and Media. His research focuses on how technological change affects the public sphere and political parties and political practices. In addition to numerous articles, he's written two books, Taking Our Country Back, The Crafting of Networked Politics from Howard Dean to Barack Obama, <coughs> and Prototype Politics, The Making and Unmaking of Technological Innovation in the Republican and Democratic Parties, 2000 to 2014. Last but not least, Rick Pildes is the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU School of Law. He is one of the leading scholars on the law of democracy, a field in which he wrote the primary casebook. He's a member of both the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Law Institute. He's been a Guggenheim Fellow and a Carnegie Scholar. He's won cases before the US Supreme Court. 
and he served as a legal advisor to both of Barack Obama's presidential campaigns. Obviously, we have a great deal of expertise here, and I'm going to let Barry get things started. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, a little housekeeping before we get to this amazing group of speakers. Uh, for those of you who are in the room, just be aware this is going to be live streamed and recorded. It's also being by Wisconsin Eye. Thank you to them for being part of this. Uh, for those of you in the legal profession, the event was approved for one Wisconsin CLE credit by the Board of uh, Bar Examiners. There are CLE sign-in sheets in the back if you're in the room. If you haven't done so already, please sign in there before you leave. If you're attending virtually and would like credit, listen for the passcode that will be given at 4.20 p.m. roughly <laughs> at the conclusion of the panel. There will be a Google form link pasted into the chat box. You will complete that form with the passcode we give you at the end of the panel by 6 p.m. Central today. Uh, in addition, we're going to make sure to leave time for questions after the presentations from both the in-person audience and the virtual audience. Those can be submitted throughout the hour as those questions come to you. If you're in person, you have an index card in front of you and can send a question my way. Those will be collected by folks in the room and brought up here so I can moderate the questions. Uh, so do that throughout the hour. If you're a virtual attendee online, you can use the Q&A function, not the chat function, the Q&A function on Zoom also to ask your questions at any time. So we'll be monitoring all of those. Uh, each panelist will have about 10 to 12 minutes and then I'll moderate a Q&A to fill out the hour. So we're gonna start online with Katie Harbath. Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead and take this one. I wanna to apologize to everyone. I've made it to Madison, but um, unfortunately tested so wanted to, of course, be safe and um, appreciate the staff for moving so quickly to allow me to do so virtually. Um, I was kind of hoping to set the stage here um, as we go into Daniel and Rick's um, presentations to kind of talk about my specialty is kind of looking at how tech has shaped elections. Daniel and I have actually known each other for quite a long time because uh, when he started doing his research, when I worked as a digital practitioner in Republican politics and then moved on to onto Facebook um, as part of this. And we have a lot to discuss of what has changed and how we think. First, um, to do some really wide context, we are at the lowest point of democracy in 30 years. We have, um, we are back to 1989 levels when you look at countries around the world. This is data from VM, um, one of the leading organizations that measures democracy around the world. Um, that they came out with here a couple of months ago. And um, we see not only democracy um, on the decline, we see dictatorships on the rise, as you can see here. And a lot of this change has happened in the last 10 years. So we have our work very much cut out for us of what this is going to look like um, and what we need to do to try to reverse and stall this trend. And that's going to get harder. The next couple of years, I think, are going to be huge moments of potential geopolitical shifts of how our world works. We not only have the elections happening here this year, particularly this fall in the United States and Brazil, but in 2024, for the first time ever, we are going to have, in the same year, a US presidential election, in addition to elections in India, um, Indonesia, Ukraine, Taiwan, Mexico, the United Kingdom, and the European Parliament, amongst many others, all at the same time. This is a dramatic increase in the number of fronts that we need to think about fighting topics of mis- and disinformation. Um, and it is something that um, we see many countries oftentimes mimicking the types of things they do in the United States, just like you see Bolsonaro in Brazil doing so with what Trump did in 2020 around trying to uh, reduce trust in the election results. And so, again, we have the next couple of years are going to be vitally important in trying to think about how we combat the many issues of protecting the integrity of elections online. To kind of take a look back, you know, if you look at the last 20 years of elections, or, or sorry, of technology and democracy, I see I see us being in about a fourth phase right now. So the first phase through 2015 was a very optimistic phase. Um, there was a lot of rose-colored glasses and optimism about the role that technology could play in democracy. This is when you had, you know, President Obama's win in 2008 and 2012. This is when you had the Arab Spring in 2011. And hopes were really high about how the internet more people to have a voice in the process. And it was seen 
as a goal and a positive thing to have candidates to talk directly to citizens using these tools. That was an active goal um, of many in this community in which to do so. And then uh, for me, May 9th, 2016 is a key moment in this timeline. That was the day of the Philippines election in 2016, as well as when something, the trending topics controversy broke for Facebook. This is when a contractor accused the company of biasing its results in the trending topics uh, to suppress conservative content. And it was sort of the, the beginning of um, the next phase of a lot of questions around bias. Um, from the right and just the company's overall reckoning with the downsides and harms that their platforms could cause all, all around the world. Um, also during that time is when we started, started seeing a regulatory phase. Um, now, what I mean by that is a lot of introduction, introduction of regulatory measures, a lot of hearing from policymakers. We've seen, while in the US, this has been a struggle to pass actual legislation at the federal level, we have seen, obviously, legislation passed in Europe. And then, unfortunately, we also see in many countries that they are passing fake law legislation under the guise of fighting fake news. But in reality, it is um, authoritarian and other governments trying to um, potentially suppress uh, minority and opposition voices, which is also a very problematic term that uh, thing that we are seeing. I believe that we are entering a new phase now, and I'm not quite sure what to call it. I used to call it decentralization because I see that rather than just having a few platforms of which we have to fight this on, we are seeing it, um, people use a lot of different platforms. In addition to your Facebooks, Googles, Twitters, Instagrams, you have to say TikTok is a new player, but you also have people using encrypted messaging services like WhatsApp, Telegram. Um, they are going on places like Discord, which is a Slack-like type of platform. You're seeing the rise of misinfo in podcasts and live audio and live video. Um, you're also seeing this in radio. And like there was a story this week about um, candidates sharing, like putting flyers in people's mailboxes that look like newspapers, but they're really not, that they accused of having misinformation. Um, the technology as we know it is changing and will look very different, I think, over the next few years entering us into this new phase. So what is it that I really see that is changing? One, um, you're seeing many platforms, particularly Facebook and Instagram, Meta, talking about a shift from prioritizing friends and family content that you see in your newsfeed to something they're calling the discovery engine. This is very much like how TikTok works. It more is using the algorithm to show you content that you didn't necessarily ask to be connected to, but you're interested in that topic. So. Like gardening, you're going to see a lot of gardening. If you like um, all the wedding videos, you might see wedding videos. Like whatever it might be, they're using the algorithm to show you that in feed. And so you're, the platforms are assuming more responsibility in terms of what actually um, the inputs are and the types of content that you might see in that feed. I talked about the decentralization of the spread of content. We're also seeing a lot of content. Um, you know, these platforms don't exist in silos, and so content will shift between these shared in different ways and you're seeing bad actors exploit loopholes in each of these platforms and using that in aggregate to try to get some of this mis and disinformation out there um i talked about all the many more flat platforms in addition to live audio and video there's the concern around what's called ephemeral content this is content that's only online for 24 hours um, we have already seen some actors say that they're going to put content on their website just for a day and then take it down or just put it on social media for a day and take it down to try to evade the detection systems of these platforms, um, but take advantage of people being able to at least see it first. You're seeing people move from like sharing content from broadcast, so one to many, like posting on your, your Facebook feed for all to see to really moving into one-in-one -in -one conversations or one to few You're seeing a big rise, and Mark Zuckerberg has talked about this in his earning calls, where more and more people are sharing content um, in messaging type groups, um, and they're segmenting them, so they might have a group, and many of you probably have this yourself. You have maybe a group with your people you work with. There's one of your friends and family, <laughs> one of the certain group of friends, maybe your college friends versus friends you've made later in life. But there's a lot more segmentation Online advertising as we're changing, as we know it, is changing. Between privacy changes that Apple has made, that Google has made, 
between regulatory um, regimes, the ability for platforms to target and provide the targeting that they have in the past is very much going to change. And the, um, how that's going to look and what people can do, I think, will continue to evolve. And then we have emerging platforms. Um, I was recently surprised by some stats about gaming. <laughs> Excuse me. In that, um, you know, 48% of people play some sort of video game. And the, um, sorry, it's like 246 million are gamers in the United States. 48% are actually women. I think the average age is 32. Um, gaming is a big area that we don't talk enough about in this space. Um, I, I didn't put this here, but I would say text messaging is another one. But you also have the metaverse. And while that may seem like that's something that's really far-fetched, um, it's something to be paying attention to. And then the last thing that I would just mention is crypto and NFTs. This is the first election where we're you're seeing the use of crypto donations and things like non-fungible tokens actually being used by campaigns as things to give to donors and other things. And it's something just to pay attention to. Lastly, we are seeing the tech companies announce a lot of their efforts around the midterm elections. Um, let's, we've had eight so far announced in probably the last couple of weeks. Um, you can see here I made this chart going through each of them and what they've chosen to highlight. You can see a lot of them talk about um, where they're going to be um, pushing authoritative information about where, when, and how to vote. Most talk about their policies around political and issue ads, which I know Daniel's going to get a lot into. Most of them talk about working with external partners, as well as what their policies are around voter suppression, what people can say, harassment of election officials, et cetera. What I find interesting, though, is where there's some differences in what they choose to focus on. Um, not surprisingly, TikTok does not mention foreign interference. Um, only a few <laughs> platforms actually talk about how their recommendation engines work and how they're thinking about that. Um, very few, whereas before 2016, one of the biggest highlights and things they'd focus on is how awesome it was that candidates were using their platforms. You don't see that anymore. Um, that is not a focus or anything that they want folks to, to know about that. So the big question now is, is this going to be enough for the midterms? That is hard to say um, ahead of time. They are obviously doing a lot, as you can see from this chart. However, there have been reports that many of these platforms, due to a variety of reasons, have been pulling back resources. They've been changing priorities in this space. And one of the things I'm nervous about, too, is that we're going to come out of the midterms and nothing like a January 6th level event will happen and people will think that maybe we're out of the clear, maybe things aren't as bad anymore. And that would be a very false security to have coming out of these midterms. Midterms are very different than presidential elections. Um, and as soon as the midterms are done, if not before, you know, people are already starting to talk about 2024, but we're going to have candidates be announcing questions around whether Trump's going to get back on the platforms or not, all of which are going to come up as soon as we are done. So there will be very little break here. That's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions, but if you do want to keep in touch with me at all, I'm not hard to find on the internet. I've got a newsletter where I talk about these issues once a week at anchorchange.substack.com, and then I'm also on Twitter at Katie Harba. Thanks so much. I'll turn it back to the room. Thank you, Katie. Uh, that is a terrific foundation. I, th I think we're going to go a little darker now with Daniel's <laughs> comments. <laughs> a nice transition, Daniel. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was wonderful, as always. And um, thank you to everybody here. It's been such a, um, a wonderful event and reception. And uh, I'm excited to talk about some really hard things uh, with you all. As somebody who lived through all four phases uh, of, the, of that <laughs> internet and has been a researcher during that time, um, I've seen a lot of shifts over time. So what I want to focus on today broadly is sort of uh, paid speech, speech in general, and threats to democracy, and do so um, from the platform and media perspective. Um, I'm a social scientist. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so this is really coming from a lot of the empirical research that my and my colleagues do at the Center for Information Technology uh, and Public Life at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, where we center questions of mis- and disinformation and democracy. Um, but also do so specifically by thinking about sort of how does that fit into uh, bigger picture questions like the history of race in the United States um, so as a way to sort of approach and think about these sorts of problems. Um, I'm going to start with a modest, um, a modest question. Um, what should we be worried about? Um, and sort of give you at least the 
10 to 12 minute version of what keeps me up at night. Um, and I had to edit this down a little bit um, and also take out all the stuff related to my four year old. But um, the, here's the stuff about democracy um, uh, that I think about. And it, what I want to be clear about, this is grounded in really the international comparative political science literature that has been um, so useful over the last few decades, really um, building a wide body of evidence for when democracies fail, um, when does backsliding occur, when do democracies face crises, et cetera. Um, and trying to think through those conditions and how they apply to our current media moment. Um, so let me start with a few things. Um, so the first is really that increase in views of the opposition as illegitimate. Um, Katie mentioned this on her first slide. This is sort of one of the most uh, familiar stories we see now. It's linked to tolerance, but that idea of polarization, right? Um, what you see in any given polity are various social groups moving further apart from one another. Um, and that places lots of strain on democracies because then you're more inclined to view people at the, on the other side um, as being a fundamental threat to your way of life, to your well-being. Um, and it also increases the perception that they might not continue playing the electoral game in the future, therefore um, posing a fundamental threat to your group. Um, that sounds really worrying um, uh, in its own right. However, we have to also think about the fact that we have the rise of anti-democratic political movements and parties happening simultaneously, right? So polarization is bad if everyone is agreeing to play the same electoral game and if everyone is committed to the same multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy. Polarization might not be so bad if part of that polarization is about a response to the rise of anti-democratic political movements and parties. And we have overwhelming evidence at this point from political science and other fields that this is disproportionately asymmetrically happening on the political right as opposed to the political left uh, in this country. And we can talk more about that later on. Um, a third piece is that erosion of public faith in democracy. Um, we've seen this in various uh, forms. There's been lots of influential work. Um, people are generally more willing to countenance, uh, let's say, political violence, for instance, um, both among uh, Americans on the whole, but also a lot of really high profile um, cases in recent years, January 6th being one of them. Um, but also think about the um, the threats uh, to the governor in, in Michigan, for instance, as being another example of this. I think you're one bullet behind. Oh, one, one bullet behind? Sorry. It's tough to see. Um, erosion of public faith in democracy. Um, and again, here's this is where things are really complicated. But one thing that we do see from uh, various political science perspectives, political communication perspectives, is that one reason democracy is eroding is because historically powerful groups no longer see it as being able to protect political, economic, uh, religious, and cultural status. Um, so groups that feel most threatened, um, and those threats are real, um, as we move towards a fuller multiracial, multiethnic democracy, um, various groups then respond in these sorts of ways as a way to prevent uh, perceived or real status decline. We can talk about that later on, too. Um, third, and I know Rick will talk about this, um, loss of gatekeeping and party nomination processes. Um, this, I think, is a really big story of social media and platforms, one that has gotten comparatively less attention than mis and disinformation, um, but has been enormous at fueling outsider candidates, particularly candidates um, who espouse more radical, more extremist views, but also candidates, as we're seeing in congressional races now across the country, which our team has been doing some work on, that have ties to groups like QAnon and various conspiracy movements. Um, when you can route around conventional party nomination processes and command independent fundraising power, independent mobilization power, that offers a threat to, to um, democracy. And finally, just the decreased accountability of political elites during elections, um, which was on the last slides, but you all know this, this idea that platforms enable elites, and so do journalists, um, to question their own electoral accountability at the ballot box. Um, and when you have partisans that are willing to listen to their elites as opposed to independent journalists, for instance, or uh, secretaries of state, Federal Election Commission, um, and other groups that are required uh, by the public to uphold the sanctity of elections uh, and the authority of elections, that means decreased accountability. Where am I? I'm going to look on your screen. 
There we go. Okay. <laughs> One challenge is that paid speech potentially facilitates all of these things and often in ways that stretch far beyond the epistemological status of information or a lot of things that Katie talked about that platforms often solve for, right? So um, platforms generally, most of them have sort of eked out solid rules that say you can't confuse uh, people with respect to the time, place, and manner of a vote, classic voter suppression. But what do we do when speech looks something more like this, which is a set of identity appeals um, specifically to Republicans and white Republicans um, that's talking about how Black Lives Matter and by proxy, the Democratic Party, which represents them, is going to put all of Republicans and white Americans in danger. That is an identity based appeal and one that's based on fear. It's tied into that idea of illegitimacy. It's tied into that idea of public faith and democracy. And it's tied with creating an existential threat for your particular group. Here, a partisan group, but partisan groups map onto other social groups in the electorate. Um, we could talk more about that uh, later on as well. So what can platforms and media outlets do specifically when it comes to paid speech? But we could also go a little bit more beyond that. And this will be um, my last set of uh, slides. First, create clear democracy-worthy policies for paid speech. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means really protecting democracy becomes the first and foremost uh, responsibility of platforms and other democratic gatekeepers in their own right. Media have to call balls and strikes and so do platforms. We can't have partisan equivalents on both sides if there we see asymmetric responses to the two parties um, with respect to things like elections, uh, wins and losses, et cetera. They need to have democracy worthy policies to protect against those things that I mentioned before. So not just mis and disinformation, but things like corrosive identity appeals that meant to portray existential threat that undermines ele uh, elections or electoral accountability. Second, they need to carve out the greatest scrutiny to elections, censuses, and violence, especially by dominant groups and state actors. This is really important. Oftentimes, platforms want to be very equal and fair. But again, the threat posed by dominant groups with respect to uh, non-dominant groups or subservient groups is very different, especially in the context of things like calls for violence or um, especially in the context of the things like calls for an, a contested election. Even more than that, they have to do something they've been historically unwilling to do is actually place political and social elites on a higher plane with a higher set of responsibilities um, than a lower one. So oftentimes Facebook and other companies have said, well, there's public value in being able to hear from the president or there's public value in being able to hear from elected officials. But we also know from political science that many citizens take their cues from elites and that elites can therefore do outsized harm when it comes to the things um, that, that democracy requires, right? So what we need to do is have a higher set of standards for them, not a lower set of ones. We need um, policies that are race and ethnicity conscious, not race neutral. Um, here broadly, my center has done a, we did a big report in the last year that talked about this, but provide greater scrutiny to speech that targets historically marginalized racial root, uh, groups um, and really account for potential harms in a richer way, account for social vulnerability and differences in social power. Um, and we need to also deny a, a platform to groups that are going to look to uphold historical or other structural forms of discrimination and power. Society is not equal, nor should we pretend it is. And especially for paid speech, which is a privilege to pay for speech, uh, I think platforms and media outlets need to do more than they do. Uh, and then the last are relatively uncontroversial. Deny a platform to people making unfounded claims that weaken democracy, including appeals of politicians against non-dominant groups. Clearly establish and condemn threats to free and fair elections and the peaceful transfer of power. We saw all the major platforms move in this direction, but after January 6th, not before. Um, they needed to do this much earlier. They needed to act much earlier after the election itself. Um, my colleague at USC and I wrote a piece that talked about putting elected officials on what they do for live broadcast on a tape delay uh, to be able to review speech before it was actually published on those platforms precisely to check against the type of violence that we saw on January 6th. And finally, they need clear policies. I'm a few behind. There we go. Mm -hmm. Clear policies, procedures, and very fair enforcement. And I'll end just handing things over to Rick um, with sort of just the reminder but it's not advancing. But the decline of democracy in the US is already happening. Um, and I think indeed around the world, as Katie put it before.
Thanks, Daniel. I warned you it would get dark. Here we are. Uh, I'll just remind you, if you're online and want to submit questions, the Q&A feature is the way to do that. Uh, some of you have been writing questions on cards here in the room. I think the way to collect those is probably to pass them to this end of the room where it'll be easy to collect. So uh, send those on down. Uh, so now we bring in money and the law and Rick Pildes. Rick. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Barry. Uh, first of all, thanks to Katie, who having just come down with COVID, still was heroically uh, working through her coughs there to still do her presentation. I was hoping to meet her in person. Uh, no. Wait, you can see if Katie's still on. You're okay, no slides, you'll just want to advance. Yeah. I only have a couple of slides, don't worry. Um, but also I want to thank Barry because I've admired um, his sort of rock solid empirical work on election related issues for many, many years and other empirical work that comes out of um, Wisconsin. Uh, so thanks very much for having me. Um, I wanted to provide a, a general perspective on uh, how I see the communications revolution uh, and modern technology changing the nature of democratic politics. It's, it's one angle into this uh, issue. Um, this is throughout the Western democracies, not just in the US. And then I will uh, provide some more specific analysis of uh, how the communications revolution is affecting campaign finance and elections. Uh, so first, on, on the big picture, my view is that uh, campaign finance, um, the communications revolution is having much more profound effects on the nature of democratic politics than simply the issues of misinformation and disinformation and hate speech and incitement and the like. I, uh, Daniel alluded to this already. Um, even if we could somehow fix those problems, either through self-regulation by the platforms or through government regulation, uh, the effects of social media and the internet age on democratic politics would still be uh, very profound in ways I think we don't fully appreciate. One way I put this is that uh, the communications revolution is bringing about the fragmentation of democratic politics throughout the West. And what I mean by fragmentation is that political power uh, is being distributed and dispersed across many more political parties in the proportional representation systems of Europe, many more hands, many more groups. Uh, there's so much more power uh, distributed across all of these different actors, including isolated individual actors. Uh, there's a great story in Germany about a guy named Rezo before their most recent uh, uh, national elections. Rezo was a, a YouTuber uh, musician in his mid-20s, uh, and he decided to make a one hour long uh, mashup video uh, attacking uh, the Christian Democrats in the run up to the election. Uh, which was fun, energetic, uh, filled with charts and data, uh, and ripped the Christian Democrats apart, but also most of the other parties in Germany. Uh, the Christian Democrats thought this was full of distortions. It got nine million views in the week before the election. The Christian Democrats were being asked in the hustings about various claims being made in this video. Uh, they were flummoxed about how to respond. They thought of trying to make their own video in response. Um, and there was a significant drop off in support for the party in the election. This is a single person sitting in the basement of his parents' house making this one hour video. Um, <coughs> fragmentation takes different forms in the European systems because it can be expressed through the emergence as, as has happened of lots and lots of new insurgent parties on the right, the left, less ideologically defined. In the US, the way this gets expressed is through the internal fragmentation of our, our two dominant parties because of the first past the post elections that, that mean we're going to have two dominant um, parties. And one way of understanding the effects of the communications revolution in the US is that it's enabled the rise of free agent independent politicians in a way that wasn't really possible 25 or 30 years earlier. So now, even in their first years in office, politicians can find through cable and social media a kind of national constituency they can build. Um, they can raise tremendous amounts of money, as we'll talk about a little bit more, through the internet. Uh, and all of this means uh, that they can have a kind of influence independent of the party, independent of party leaders, that was just incomprehensible even 25 years ago. So when I first made this point, this was around 2014, um, I used Ted Cruz in the Senate in his first year and Liz Warren in her first year in the Senate 
both of whom had a, a kind of outsized influence that first year senators almost never had before because of their social media presence, because of their fundraising presence through the internet. Um, now AOC is probably the best example of this. She won a primary election initially with about 16,000 votes in a safe democratic seat, but she went into Congress with 9 million followers on between Twitter, Instagram, and whatever the third platform was, I forget. Um, the next highest number of followers among Democratic politicians was Nancy Pelosi with about 2 million, and the next was about 200,000. Uh, and so she had an ability to have a kind of influence from the moment she walked into the House that, again, was just inconceivable 20 years ago. And part of what this means is that political leaders in Congress, this isn't just about the loss of gatekeeping you know, in primary elections, but in government, political leaders, party leaders, no longer have the kind of leverage they had over their members to bring them along to make difficult votes that party leaders think is in the interest of the party as a whole. Hopefully they think it's good policy too. But they don't have to work their way up through the party hierarchy. Uh, they, they don't need to be on good committees to raise money or to have high profiles. Uh, and so when Republicans were in control of the House, you may remember they devoured two of their own speakers of the House, John Boehner and Paul Ryan, because they could not control their own internal factions. I read Boehner's memoir, which is very interesting about this. Um, and one of the ways he puts it, this is a quote from him, I may have been the speaker, but I didn't hold the power. By 2013, the insurgent caucus, or sometimes he calls it the chaos caucus in the House, had built up their own power base thanks to fawning right-wing media and outrage-driven fundraising cash. And you see the kind of fragmentation within the Democratic Party when the Democrats got control of the House after Joe Biden was elected, and that long period of internal conflict that precluded the Democrats from passing the infrastructure bill for a long, long time, uh, that led to declining ratings of support for Congress and for President Biden. Um, and all of this changed only because of the state elections in 2021 when the Democrats uh, were, were beaten very badly in places like Virginia and New Jersey. Uh, and suddenly there was a willingness to kind of overcome those factions and agree to certain kinds of deals that now we've seen um, gone through. Um, so the fragmentation of politics in these ways through the communications revolution has made effective governance far more difficult. It's true in Europe and it's true here in the United States. Now to talk a little bit more about uh, campaign finance in particular in technology, and we've ar you've already kind of you know, gotten a sense of the story here. Um, technology has enabled the rise of small donors. It's completely reduced the transactions cost of finding small donors, of small donors being able to contribute. Um, and this is uh, often celebrated as enabling more political equality in the fundraising system, uh, enabling more participation. Um, and it's as if we're still in that first stage in you know, Katie's topology of the internet when it comes to the role of the internet in fundraising. There's still this optimism that this is you know, an incredibly equalizing uh, technique or tool, uh, raising small donations through the internet. Uh, but actually, when you look at who this fundraising technique empowers, um, you'll see something I think is disturbing, troubling, um, and it relates to how we ought to think about reform in this area. So it's hard to read these numbers, but I put together numbers on who in the House is most dependent on small donors among their fundraising. And the names you're going to see on this list are you know, powerful people like Nancy Pelosi with these kinds of positions, but also the polls of the parties. You see AOC gets 80% of her money from small donors. You see people on here like Jim Jordan, uh, Katie Porter, Matt Gates, Elon Omar, uh, Adam Schiff. Um, and I've looked at this more broadly, and not surprisingly, the dynamics of fundraising on the internet are like the dynamics of everything on the internet, which is the more provocative, the more extreme, the more outrage, the more attention, the more the money comes in. And one striking example of this is when Marjorie Taylor Greene was stripped of her House committee assignments uh, 
she raised over $3 million almost immediately in that next quarter. Uh, the average donation was $32. Uh, and that was the most almost any I think anyone had raised in a quarter in a non-election year uh, because of uh, her profile through um, social media. Um, now, the general story here is, in my view, that small donors are sources that fuel polarization that we already have in our politics. Um, they are like so much else with the Internet. Uh, and so one of the major campaign finance proposals that reform groups have been pushing for a number of years now is what's called small donor matching programs for campaign finance. The idea being that the government, this was actually in the Democrats' uh, voting reform bills, uh, that the uh, government would provide $6 in funding for every $1 a candidate raised in a donation that was under $250. Um, and this is, you know, argued for in the names of name of enhancing political equality in the fundraising sphere. Uh, but when you actually pay attention to the flow of small donations uh, and the extent to which uh, it fuels the polls of the parties, uh, you think about throwing all of that public money on the back of that dynamic, uh, and you would, I, there is great risk that we would further fuel the extremist and polarizing forces in the political culture. Uh, and so I have uh, probably been the most prominent person who's willing to go out there and say <laughs> that this is a mistake. Um, I know there are many moderate uh, politicians who actually do believe this or have come to believe this. Uh, almost none of them will say so publicly. Uh, but I, I think this is something uh, we need to understand as we get more mature about thinking about social media and the internet, not just about information, but about uh, campaign finance uh, uh, and its effects on our politics. The last thing I'll say about that is if uh, you do want to see reform in the campaign finance area, uh, I think it's much better to think about the old fashioned traditional forms of public financing where the money comes from the treasury, you're not doing it on the backs of small donors or any other particular type of donor, uh, and government provides you know, grants of various sorts. It's, it's not easy to structure a public financing system so it works well, uh, but that's a, a, a politically neutral source of public funding for elections rather than what's currently the, the, all the, the fad among the reform community which is small donor matching program. So let me stop there so there's time for questions. Thank you, Rick. Um, let me just say for the attorneys who are watching online, now's the time to get your password to get that one CLE credit. Today's passcode is STATE, S-T-A-T-E, uppercase or lowercase, doesn't matter. That's what you want to enter into the online form to get credit for. Uh, so a few questions we've got uh, in the 15 minutes remaining are sort of directed towards solutions. I think we've identified concerns, problems, worries that keep Daniel up at night. But the question is, what solutions are there? Uh, Katie mentioned legislation in other countries. And I wonder if she might say a word about the degree to which that seems viable or effective in the US. And then I wonder, uh, for both of you to think about the areas you commented on, Daniel, whether there are things you think the law ought to do to constrain social media platforms or the platforms ought to regulate themselves? And how do you prevent down market, lower quality platforms from opening up <laughs> to take the place of the ones that get regulated? Uh, and is there anything, Rick, besides public financing to deal with the misinformation problem? So Katie, your thoughts on what we might do in the US? Yeah. Um When thinking about regulation, we do have reg regulation that's been passed in Europe, and I think that that will have some trickle-down effect in the United States, especially as some of the platforms need to build some of these transparency uh -huh. options um, and things like that in order to comply with the DSA and DMA. Um, they'll probably end up doing a lot of those just globally. We are also seeing regulation happening in the states, and something I'm actually really keeping an eye on is the 2023 state legislative sessions that will happen early in that year, and not only the types of voting laws they might put into place, but ones around content moderation. 
your more right-leaning state legislatures will probably be focused on, you know, they want less censorship. And the ones that are more Democratic-leaning will probably want more from the companies in terms of fighting this. And so we may see the federal government get pinched from these two ends of what should be done. Me right now, I'm very much on the transparency bandwagon. I think we need, need more data in order to have more study about what is actually happening on these platforms and how things are happening across platforms in order to truly understand the problem that we are trying to solve and in order to even just find what success looks like. Because I think that is a big challenge right now because we can broadly say what the problem is, but we can't, don't know enough to really specifically say what we need to solve it. Daniel. Um, so yeah, as a researcher, let me echo that. Uh, we've been we've been I've been part of many groups and including with colleagues in in the room that for years have been talking about increased uh, data access from the major leading platforms so social scientists can uh, have more robust understanding and documentation of what's going on. Um, and and again, what are the threats and the problems? Um, so I would say that I would say we need much better disclosure uh, across the board, uh, especially around paid speech, but also around things like um, influencer relationships. So ways that the public can know in a much clearer way uh, who's behind the speech that they're seeing online. Um, as I sort of outlined more broadly, I think the platforms can go farther in terms of, and, and I agree 100% with Katie's analysis of the, of the current political pressures that are on platforms. Um, but at least the reality is for now, they have broad latitude um, to set their own content policies. Um, and I think they could be more robust um, and much more consistently and fairly enforcing policies that are both already on the books when it comes to things like uh, election related speech, but also go beyond that. So just looking at Rick's last slide around financing the liberalism, um, you know, platforms are an important choke point, for instance, uh, on political ads that raise money. Um, and, you know, Facebook could start to place limits and restrictions on what sorts of uh, political advertising with respect to soliciting um, uh, funding for various candidates, including candidates who embrace liberalism, um, like deny the election vote. Um, they have broad latitude to do so. Politically, it would be difficult. Um, but again, I don't, I don't think we're in normal times. Um, and I think the, the threats here are, are pretty significant. So I'd like to see a more robust response. Uh, so I'm not sure I have a lot more to say about campaign finance in particular, but the way I would take your question is, you know, I, I think a lot about institutional reforms to mitigate extremism um, to the extent possible through institutional design. I'll take off a few things that, that I kind of advocate in that area. Um, one is uh, we've lost hold of the importance of creating competitive election districts and gerrymandering or in designing districts we're so focused on partisan outcome measures uh, but you can have uh, fair maps in which everyone is elected with 70 percent of the vote in a very very safe seat uh, and i think competitive election districts uh, push candidates and office holders more towards the center they're also make uh, legislatures more responsive to changes in public policy preferences of voters. If you're in a 65% district and you lose five points of support, it doesn't really matter. If you're in a 55% district and you lose five points of support, it, it makes a difference. That's one. Uh, a second uh, is, uh, this is a big issue to put on the table, but you alluded to it in your notes. The most radical thing we've done to the American democratic system in the last 50 years is get rid of the convention system, uh, get rid of any role at all for elected party figures in filtering potential nominees from their parties for the presidency when we shifted to this pure plebiscitory or primary driven system for making that decision. We're a complete outlier among democracies in using a system like that to choose party leaders or nominees for the chief executive of the country. Um, it's tough in the political culture to push back on that, but if we can find a way to build in at least a little bit more of a role for party figures and playing some filtering uh, role, that might be a good thing in mitigating some of the extremism that's now possible when free, freelance individual kind of candidates can essentially take parties hostage through this process. Um, I'm a big proponent, well, big, big is too strong. I'm, I'm in, I endorse the experiments going on 
with uh, things like top four primaries and ranked choice voting, the, what Alaska has now adopted, what Maine has adopted in a, in a more minimal form, uh, as a way of uh, trying to make it more likely candidates who have the broadest electoral appeal will actually get to face the general election voters instead of being shut out by the primary process. Uh, so I'm hopeful that will uh, make a difference. And the last thing is I say do no harm. So when it comes to campaign finance, you know, as I said, uh, be very careful about small donor matching programs as the desirable path of reform, if that will only further fuel extremism in our politics. And so uh, Rick, Dan Tokaji asked whether it would be helpful to route funding to parties, maybe publicly fund parties rather than have candidates. Your chart showed the candidates as the offenders, not the parties. Does that lead us towards a more centrist politics and maybe more responsible activity on social media platforms? Yeah, so one of the things that fragmentation does or one of the expressions of fragmentation is, you know, all the money that's in the hands of these outside groups now People associate that with Citizens United. That's only partly right. It really goes back to McCain-Feingold. When McCain-Feingold eliminated what was called soft money to the parties, there was an immediate rise of all these outside groups. Many of these outside groups are seeing, you know, they're, they're much more ideologically purist. They're focused on one or two particular issues. The parties are broad aggregations of interests. Uh, it's also the case that when parties spend money on candidates, they are not so ideological. They want to win. They'll support moderates. They'll support more extreme candidates if they think that candidate has a chance of the party capturing the seat. So yes, and by the way, Dan, I hope you're recovering from COVID also. I was supposed to have lunch with Dan, and he couldn't make it. Um, but, um, uh, but I do think strengthening the parties and more money through the parties would be helpful. At the same time, that would also require changing the organization of these parties and making the people who actually run these organizations the kind of people we want kind of in control of these sorts of resources. Right now, these organizations are weak, and so they have weak people running them. But in general, yes, I agree with the suggestion that routing more money through the parties is something we ought to be thinking about. And Katie, the chart that you showed indicates that most of the platforms are allowing paid political ads or issue ads. Sometimes those are frozen in the final days of the campaign, uh, but they're permitted. What do you think about the idea of not allowing that or requiring the purchasers to be parties or something bigger than candidates? Well, first, I would say I think the parties are just as much to blame as candidates. Um, if you follow what's been happening at the NRSC and some of the questions around their recent digital stuff that they've been doing and the spending and all of that, like I don't necessarily think that just consolidating this in the parties is, is going to be is going to be the right answer. On political ads, um, so only Meta does the last the ban in the last week of the election. Some companies or platforms are banning them completely, though I will say banning ads is just as hard as allowing them. Um, you can see if you follow what's happening in Washington State. Um, with their regulation and the challenges that companies like Meta and Google are having in which to follow that um, is really challenging. Um, in general, if we're going to have ad blackouts, like you see in most of the world, the U.S. is one of the few places that does not have any sort of blackout thing. It's got to be, that's one of the things that has to come from a regulatory measure. Just having some platforms do it and others don't do it, I don't think will have as big of an impact as potentially um, if, if it requires everyone to do it, but we have to know it comes with some distinct trade-offs. Some distinct trade-offs of organizations being able to do, get out the vote efforts and being able to do some last minute efforts to try to combat mis and disinformation that may be out there. So it is something to consider, but it is not something that doesn't come back, come with drawbacks. If I could just um, say a real quick word here. Um, I think we have to be very clear about diagnosing what the problem is, right? So the same political advertising tools that might allow some candidates to lie to the electorate are also the same political advertising tools that drive black participation in voting, for instance, when purchased by the NAACP. Um, I don't think ad blackouts are a good idea. Um, I think ads are an important and a powerful tool often to mobilize parts of the electorate. 
Um, I think they can be bad, but I think what platforms should do is actually hire more people to do the content moderation to make a set of contextual related decisions between which ads promote political participation in healthy democratic ways and which don't and own those decisions rather than saying nothing should happen whatsoever. And I think you see this throughout the board is like, Platforms will step in and say, well, we're going to just create one rule and that's going to be that's going to apply to everyone equally. But the reality is, is that oftentimes a lot of small campaigns that are pro-democratic, that are mobilizing voters that are tougher to reach. My colleagues at the Tech Policy Center at UNC um, did a big study of the of the Facebook ad blackouts and who did it hurt the most? It hurt um, uh, non-incumbent campaigns that were challenging, often very entrenched incumbents. I think that can be pro-democratic. It could be anti-democratic, but it also be pro-democratic. And it also hurt democratic campaigns because their voters are harder to reach and harder to mobilize. So in, in essence, creating an ad blackout, who does that hurt and who does that benefit has to be considered. I don't think that ads are by their very nature anti-democratic. Thank you. Oh, we've just come about to the end of our hour, so I want to say a couple of things. First, we can keep the conversation going. For those who are in the room, there'll be a reception afterwards with some refreshments in the back, so hang around and ask questions of our panelists. Uh, if you're online, there'll be an online evaluation forum. We would love to have your feedback on what you thought about this event, past events, if you took part in those, um, and what you'd like to see. There is one more event in this series on October 11th. That's a Tuesday, 4 p.m. Same format in this room, if you're in person or, or on Zoom, if you're online, so hybrid options are available. You can register for that event at the same site where you registered for this one, and there'll be more notices about that. Uh, several of you have asked in the Q&A about seeing the slides again. You want to catch those because they went by too quickly. A recording of this event will be posted online on the YouTube channel, on WISI's website, and elsewhere, so there'll be opportunities to see it there. So let's thank our panelists and thank all of you for being here today.